What's up everybody? Welcome back to Diesel Creek. My name is Matt. We're on another recovery mission. A couple videos back you may have seen I recovered an Alice Chalmers HD6 out of the woods where it had been sitting for 50 years. And if you haven't seen that video, good video. Link is down in the description. But since I posted that video, it was like the floodgates opened and everybody with a derelict Alice Chalmers or any, any track loader for that matter, started emailing me or calling me and saying, hey, I got this one over here and I got this one over here and so-and-so has this one down the road. Well, I can't save them all as much as I would like to. It's just not possible. But the one we're going after right now is close to home and cheap enough. I have not even seen a picture of it yet or anything. So you guys are going to see it for the first time with me here. We're going to be there in nine minutes. Well, we're backing up to it right now. Well, here she be. This is an Alice Chalmers HD5. The guy says it's been sitting here at least six, but maybe ten years. Pretty good undercarriage on it. Got some life left. The chains are starting to get a little wear, but not terrible. Says he pulled the head off the Detroit here. It's 271. Said he pulled the head off of it a while back and uh, was cleaning it up. And might have knocked one of the nozzles off the injectors. So couldn't get it to run. I don't really have a whole lot of time to tinker with it today. I'm just going to try to winch it up out of here. First task is going to be getting the bucket off the ground. I'm hoping we can just pin the lever back like I did with that uh, international loader a while back and crank it over till the bucket's off the ground. Move the jump pack on the battery leads here through a bungee on what I believe is the control to raise the bucket. Should be able to just turn her over now and slowly but surely that bucket should come up if the starter works. Uh-oh. <laughs> Something's not happy in that valve cover. I didn't even realize it wasn't seated on there. Oh, what we got going on here? All right, so we heard a little bang there when we cranked it over, or pulled the valve cover open to find uh, the the rocker assembly and everything was just sitting here loosely uh, with some random parts here. So he had the injectors pulled out, and we likely need a new one, but. To do what I'm doing, we best to just throw it back together real quick. And there is a slight chance we could get it to run, but uh, not overly optimistic on that point right now. But at least we'll have it back together. We won't lose any pieces, and we can maybe get this bucket up off the ground. I had to throw the injector hold down bracket back on here, and then just bolt down the rocker arm assembly. I already did this side. Just got to tighten the fuel lines, and I'll repeat the process over here. <laughs> Well, we got that all back together. Hopefully it stays together. Apologies guys, I didn't have a whole lot of time the day that this all happened. I was trying to get out of there in a hurry, so I wasn't really taking the time to explain what I was doing, but basically I was trying to crank the engine over while I had the hydraulics pinned into the raise position and raise the bucket. If the engine started, that would have just been a bonus, but what ended up happening was I had the bucket curled all the way back, and I didn't realize that was the control I was holding and I was building up hydraulic pressure just making the engine turn over very slow so as you can see here I switched the controls and it spins over a heck of a lot faster and the bucket starts to go up oh there's there's action yep that's, that's what it was <laughs> hell it sounded like it was wanting to start it might Oh, 
Roblox actually seem like they're pretty snappy now. A lot faster. high enough where we can winch her on. Well, as one would expect, that was a bit of a process, but we did manage to get it up there. That, that old Harbor Freight winch is worth every penny. Take this home and do some petting on it. Hey guys, got to jump in real quick here. This is your last chance to order some stuff from the store and make sure it's here by Christmas time. And that's just for us here in the continental US. Uh, if you're overseas, it's probably already too late. Um, you'll get it. It just probably won't be before Christmas. Shipping gets crazy this time of year. So uh, if you're wanting to pick up any sweet swag to have underneath the uh, underneath the tree for Christmas morning for you or yourself or a friend or a loved one or your kids or whatever it is, uh, head on over to the store right now, dieselcreek.com. Pick yourself up something nice. Something really nice. Huh? Anyways, guys, back to the video. Well, it has been several months since this whole saga started out. Can't remember right now when I even picked this thing up, whether it was July or August. All I know is it was a lot warmer at that time. I would like to get this thing going and uh, maybe use it. So as I believe I mentioned at the beginning of the video, the fella I bought this unit from 
uh, claims that he pulled the head off for some reason. He never did tell me why, so Lord only knows what the reason for that was. But when he did, he was cleaning up the carbon on the underside of the head and he took the injector nozzles right off with the old whiz wheels. So knowing that, we know for sure these injectors in here need to come out. We also need to double check and make sure that he has the head torqued down correctly because the entire valve train and the fuel rack and everything was just kind of sitting on there whenever I got there. As you guys saw, I cranked it over and everything started jumping around under there. So what do I need to do? I need to grab a torque wrench. We will verify our torque specifications here on this head. Make sure it's cranked down correctly. After we know the head's good and torqued down proper, we can go ahead and pull the injectors out, put some new ones in it, and readjust everything. Got our torque wrench all set here. Oh, yeah, he's got him torqued down. Yeah, okay, we're good with that. It's honestly good we're in here doing this anyways. We probably are better off that it didn't fire up at that guy's place even though it would have been substantially easier to load it. This stuff was all just ran down with the impact there, as you guys saw. So better that we're in here again and make sure everything's adjusted properly. So there's our injector hold down bracket loosened up. We can pull that out of there. It's been a while. I don't remember if that was even on there. We might have put that in there. Injector comes right up out of there. There's our old injector. Send that back for a core. If anybody's curious out there, these are HV6 injectors. You know what? I'm sticking it right back in there though, because I forgot to blow all this out with a compressor. We got us some new injectors here, and of course for that we reached out to our friends over at Area Diesel Service, so big shout out to them. They are always coming through. I think I called them two days ago, and these were here this morning. So, hard to beat that. There's our remanufactured injector. Slap that guy in here, and hopefully this solves our issues. There is a dowel pin on the bottom of the injector here, so we gotta make sure that's located in there properly and then we can reinstall our hold down. I know that this hold down is not that critical, but the book calls for 25 foot pounds, so that's what we torqued it to. We can reinstall our rocker arms here. We will torque these guys down as well. Looks like these guys go to 125 foot-pounds. All right, so I put these fuel lines back in place here just to keep dirt out of the uh, fuel delivery galleries. I'm going to switch out our other injector real quick, and then we're going to have to set our valve, set our valve lash, and then our injector timing, which I can show you how to do that. We kind of got some special tools to do that. And thanks to a generous subscriber, the only reason I even have them. I'm surprised at how easy these injectors actually come up out of here. I don't know how well I'm really going to be able to show you guys here, but I was trying to 
show you why we were replacing these injectors. A, I believe they're probably original. Since they have this little OEM tag in there that says uh, diesel equipment GM HV6, they could be very well the original injectors to the machine. So they're probably a little gummed up at this point, especially for as long as this thing's been sitting. But the, uh, the tip here where your fuel comes out and is atomized, this one here I don't think he got very bad, but this one over here is significantly shorter on the tip length and it's, it's on an angle as well. So he, uh, he definitely caught it with the whiz wheel pretty good. So that fuel was probably not atomizing out of there at all. I highly doubt you guys can see it on screen. I'm actually able to compress and fire these injectors by hand. You can run the plunger all the way down and it actually sprays out of the, out of the ports there. I just did both of them. It produces such a fine stream of fuel that I'm sure you guys can't see it on camera. Uh, but here in person, I did the new one and then I did the two used ones that came out. And this one looked beautiful. I mean, you had like four or five, I didn't count them, I think it's five perfect streams of fuel shooting out in every direction. These two had like three, maybe four, and they were stubbly broken streams of fuel. So these injectors definitely aren't in the best of condition here, and it's a good thing we are gonna replace them. So like I said, big thanks again to our friends at Area Diesel Service for getting these over to me as quickly as they did so we can get this thing all back together. So we are deep into the uh, cold, nasty time of year. It is December right now. So when I had a window to work on these things, I remembered to call Area Diesel Service and they got these things right over to me. And uh, now we're here working on them. All right, that guy's down in there seated properly. There we go. Probably one of the easier engines to change injectors on out there. All right, so with our injectors installed and our rocker arms and everything bolted back down, we gotta go ahead and check our exhaust valve lash. Now, this is not like your typical four-stroke engine. These are both exhaust valve rockers on the outsides here. There is no intake valve. That's why this is a two-stroke diesel. The center one runs the injector firing, and that's what we need to set ultimately. But in order to set injector timing, we have to set our exhaust valve and make sure it's right. So I'm gonna to try to bump the engine over right now and get it to where the exhaust valves are completely compressed on this number one. So we need to make sure our exhaust valve rockers are both loose. This one, yeah, see we're actually tight on this one right now, but not on this one. So we know they're out of adjustment. To adjust these rocker arms, there's a lock nut back here on the back of the rocker, and then you turn the push rod and that adjusts your, that adjusts your lash from the rocker to the valve stem and or injector. The engine is in a good position right now to adjust number two. So we'll get that one first and then we'll spin it get number one, and then we'll do our injector timing. Yep, our valve lash is way too loose. So you don't need them, but I got these fancy adjusting wrenches here that should make adjusting this valve lash that much easier. We'll see that tightened up quite a bit when we did that. All right, so the way the Detroit book, so the way the Detroit book tells you to set these valve clearances is you should run the feeler gauge and adjust it to 13 thou, and then after you tighten the lock nut on the rocker arm, you should be able to slide the 11 thousandths shim right through there very easily. So this special Detroit tune-up set I have has special feeler gauges made up just for that. So you have a 13th. You have a 13 thou and an 11 thou shim on one feeler gauge. That way you can set it with the 13, clearance it with the 11. And we have number two set correctly now. Let's do number one.
All right, looks like we're in a good place now. Yeah, this guy here is way out of adjustment because it's tight all the time. I haven't seen it loosen up yet. Oh yeah, not even, not even thinking about getting the eleven thousands shim in there right now. All right, we got the first one set. Perfect. Nailed it. Now we can set our injector timing. So to check the injector timing, we need to set the engine where the exhaust valves are completely depressed. And then we have this special clearancing tool here that is a predetermined length from this shoulder up to this square here. And you use that as a gauge to tell you where to adjust your injector to. So let's try to bump the engine and get the exhaust valves compressed on number one first. So I'm trying to get you guys into a position where you can actually see what's going on here. There's this little hole here in the top of the injector. You set this clearancing tool down in that hole, and then you should just barely kiss the top of the injector. You should be able to clear the injector, but you should kind of feel it touching it a little bit. And we are actually right on the money. I don't think I could adjust that any better. So we're going to let that one go. We can connect the fuel lines on that one. Cylinder number one is done. Check the clearance on number two here. It is a little high. We'll go ahead and adjust that down. We should be all set. I'll just slowly adjust this thing until, there we go. Our little shim dealio slides over top of the injector. And then we hold our, hold that adjustment, tighten the lock nut, and we should be good to go. There we go. Top end is set. All right, with that all done, I think we should be ready to try to fire this thing up. Nothing like the sound of a two-stroke Detroit to break the silence of nature. All right, here goes nothing. Contact. Well, we started to get a little bit of smoke, but I think it was coming more from the starter than anywhere. <laughs> she just doesn't seem like she wants to turn over fast enough. Any damage to the starter is probably already done. So to get a little more speed out of her, let's go ahead and turn this thing up to 24 volts. We're also gonna get ready with a little bit of ether. Just a little visit from the ether bunny. Guys all ready? Contact. <laughs> Woo! Beautiful. We got a little fuel leak going. We also can't run it very long because I don't think we have any coolant. Yeah, I had to go ahead and shut her down. This is fuel leaking off this return line. I think I have it cranked down, but it is leaking pretty good. What that'll do is just end up funneling straight down into the bottom end, contaminating our engine oil with diesel fuel. But it ran! <laughs> it actually sounded pretty good. I'm really excited. I've never run an HD5 or an HD6 like that one over there, but these are two different engines. So the smaller guy, the HD5, has this 271 Detroit. That one over there has a four-cylinder Buddha diesel engine in it, and we're going to revisit that thing one of these days. If you haven't seen the video of me dragging that thing out of the woods where it sat for about 50 years, it's worth the watch. Pretty good video. I have this special line wrench for these 
fuel lines, so maybe we can get the proper torque out of it with this guy. That's pretty snug. Let's see if it's still going to leak on us. Contact! Oh yeah, leaking worse. What are we going to do about that now? I'm going to take that back off and inspect it, see if there's maybe just dirt or something, not letting it seal up properly. I'll go ahead and pull the fitting that it connects to up out of here. Huh. I really don't see any damage to this fitting. I don't know if it's going to focus for you guys, but it looks good. The opposing flare on the fuel line also looks good, so I'm really confused as to why we're having a leak here. Oh, you know what it is? The line itself is cracked. It's not, it's not coming out of the fitting. It's cracked up here. So we're going to have to get a new line, I guess. If I wanted to kind of farmer fix it up here, I probably could because this is the return line, so there's no pressure in it. It just goes back to tank. I think. I think that's how these work. All right, so we're in the shop now, and we need to make a new one of these. So, there's nothing proprietary about this. It's just, what, eighth inch tubing, and uh, it's got some nuts on it. So, we got us a piece of regular old brake line here, and we can start bending us up a one to match this guy. There we go. With a little bit of fiddling and a little bit of bending and a little bit of flaring, we have a line that we should be able to make work. Might have to uh, do a little bit of hand adjusting once we get it on the machine, but I think it's pretty close. We can get it, get it to work. All right, moment of truth. We're back here on the machine. Let's see if our new line is going to fit. Oh yeah, it's gonna work good. A little bit of hand bending, like I said, we're not perfectly lined up. But this line that I'm using, I don't know what they call it, but it's that stuff. It's like repair line, and it's easier to bend than these rigid steel lines. It's kind of like EMT conduit versus rigid conduit. It's just got a little bit more flex in it. Consequently, it likes to seal up better too, I think. Like if I had a defect in this flare, it would kind of be a little more forgiving. All right, let's see if we can't fire this thing up and check for leaks. It's actually the next day, and it's quite a bit colder today than it was yesterday, so we're going to see if it's going to cold start without any ether. I'm still running it on 24 volts because I just don't think that starter likes us anymore, but I'm pretty sure it's a 12-volt starter that we're running on 24 volts. They love that kind. All right, are you ready, kids? Contact. Come on, baby. Turning over plenty fast enough. Let's give her again contact. Oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> Doesn't look like we got any leaks. Listen to that baby purr. I think our muffler has seen better days. All right, well, we took care of our fuel leak, but we still need to add some coolant to it, so I can't run it here very long. Let's check oil pressure. I know we've got some. Yeah. I don't think our gauge works. 
it's reading zero oil pressure, but I know we have to have it because it's pumping it up here to the top end, lubricating the uh, push rods and everything, the rockers. <laughs> I love it. So the old girl seems to run pretty good. I really can't complain about that one bit. Big thanks again to Area Diesel Service for getting us those injectors out. Otherwise this would not have happened, I don't think. Those injectors were definitely in rough shape. I'm going to go ahead and clean up the ceiling surface here on the head. Try to wipe out as much of that dirt as I can. But uh, ultimately it's a Detroit. It doesn't really matter. These things will... You probably pour gravel down on the bottom end of this thing and it'll still run for a while. But anyways, we'll clean that up. We can throw the valve cover back on and then move on to our radiator hose, or lack thereof. I think this one's seen better days. We got this done just in time too, because it is starting to snow. We'll start getting all these snowflakes down in the engine. We're so close to trying this thing out. <clears throat> I'm excited. but also frustrated because it is getting cold. I'm going to go check my inventory, see what we got in the way of this size. All right, so I rummaged through all the, the hoard of stuff that I keep, and I came up with this tube here. I think this one might work, just maybe. I'm going to go ahead and give her a slice and dice, see if it's going to fit on there. We've got nothing to lose, even if it, even if it doesn't. This is something I just saved off of something that got scrapped. Doing this kind of stuff right here, is what can be the most frustrating and also the most rewarding parts of working on this old junk because you just got to make stuff work. It's not like you're going to go down to Napa and tell them you need a top rad hose for a 1960s Alice Chalmers HD5. Like, they're just going to look at you with three heads. <clears throat> if you're lucky enough to have a good one to take down there and match up, you might have something. But... A lot of times they don't stock that many of those kind of things. A lot of the hoses are all specialty things today. Back in the day, most hoses were a lot more simple. Nowadays they're all pre-bent and specific to an application. But it's always a good feeling when you get something to work. Especially if you've been hoarding it for years like I have. I think we can get this on there. I'm not going to lie to you, it's, it's not perfect. It could definitely use to be a little longer. But we are over the uh, the rib on both bungs, so hopefully we can get it to seal. Okay, I think we are ready to try to add some antifreeze here. So even though we know the unit runs now, that doesn't mean we're out of the woods yet. Quite literally, you can see we're still in the woods. But there could be a various host of other things wrong with this thing. I'm pretty sure the hydraulics function because we were able to use the uh, starter to crank the uh, the bucket up there when we loaded it. We still have a master clutch to make sure it's still good, and we have steering clutches and brakes, so we need to make sure all that's good before we really call this a win. So I'm gonna go get some antifreeze, and after we got that in there, hopefully we're ready to play with this thing. Time for a little drinky poo. Normally, I would not go straight to actual coolant. With something like this, I would like to put water in it first, run it, make sure that we don't have any leaks, and then drain the water out and that'll help flush everything out anyways. But today, we're already below freezing. So I don't think that's the best plan. There's two gallons. We've got antifreeze up over the fins and down through our radiator hose. Doesn't look like anything's leaking, so that's good. I'm going to fire this thing up and see if we can't get it hot, circulate the system, make sure we don't have any leaks anywhere. All right, can I get a contact? What are we, out of fuel? What the heck? I don't know why it's not running now. It's like it wants to go. It's getting fuel because it's smoking. Oh, 
Oh yeah! <laughs> yeah, baby, it works. At least the hydraulics do. We're leaking something. Well, like I said, it's leaking something pretty good. I still can't tell what. It looks too thin to be engine oil, but it's definitely not fuel either. It could just be water trapped in a bell housing somewhere or something. That's not impossible, but I don't like the, uh, I don't like the looks of it and definitely don't want to be spilling all that stuff on the ground. But we're kind of in a mud hole here, so I'm going to pull this thing up. Hopefully, we can drive it forward. I still haven't confirmed that yet. I'll fire this thing back up, and hopefully, we can pull it up there onto the rock. I think we're also losing our fuel prime here when this thing is sitting. It's bleeding off the fuel prime pretty quick. Looks like we didn't run our jump pack down. shifter that's pretty terrible. I can't tell what I'm doing with this shifter at all. We're going to put it in some semblance of gear and just see what happens. Oh yeah, we've got forward travel. Do we have steering? Because we need to turn left here. Not, not really steering yet. We have brakes. Oh yeah, we got brakes. <laughs> we need some throttle. We can steer left, but it's not wanting to steer right very well. Yep, nope. Right steering clutch appears to be stuck. That's a bummer. If I can find reverse, we should be able to, uh, there we go, should be able to steer. Don't stall it out. Ah! So the governor does not appear to be governing too well, or we have a fuel issue, which I think I'm leaning towards a fuel issue. The left side steering and braking and everything appears to work great. Right side, not so much.
Well, I was really hoping that we could just start digging with this thing. I was going to be uh, playing in this pile of millings behind me, but as you guys can tell, that's not going to happen right away. We got to find out what that leak is underneath, but before we do that, let's just have a good little walk around this thing. Now that we got it kind of opened up and running and everything, we can have a better gander at it than you guys have gotten yet. All in all, I think it's pretty much exactly what you would expect for a $500 machine. We've got an engine that, uh, well, it runs, but it's got some issues we still need to address. Obviously some leaks. Our hydraulics function, but you can see they're puking oil out of there already, out of the seals. And, you know, you could throw seals in there pretty easy. These ones are easy to rebuild, but the trouble is you'd be wasting your time because the chrome is gone off these cylinders. This one is actually the better one. I don't know how well it's going to show up on camera, but it is just patches of chrome remaining. The bulk of it is gone. To run your hand around it, it just feels all these grooves in the cylinder. You should not be able to feel anything. It should be perfectly smooth. I am walking under the loader right now, but don't worry, I have it braced up here. It's not going anywhere. This cylinder over here, you can't hardly tell it ever even had chrome. I mean, there's pretty much none left on it. It's actually smoother for it though. I see we have a fuel filter right there, so we can see if there's any water or something in that. Could potentially be some of our issue. So it steers left, but not right. Explain the controls for you guys if you're uh, not familiar with older dozers. Sitting in the operator's chair here, you have a gear shifter down here, which I don't think is supposed to twist like that. I think it's supposed to be straight pulls forward and backward. And from what I can tell, I only got it into two different gears there, maybe three. This is also my first time running one of these, but from what I can tell, the forward gears are forward and these ones back here are reverse gears. So you probably have one, two, three in forward and one, two, three in reverse. After you've made your gear selection, you would engage your master clutch, which is the one with the golf ball on it. That would start you going forward or backwards at whatever speed you picked. When you come upon a need to turn, if you wanted to steer to the left, you would have to pull the left steering clutch all the way back. And if you needed to turn sharper, you can break that left track and that'll make you hard pivot on the left track. The same goes for the right side. If you needed to turn right, pull back the clutch, stab the brake to turn sharp. In our case, the clutch comes all the way back, but unfortunately it's not releasing the drive to that right side. It seems like the brake works because as soon as you hit the brake, it really bogs the engine, but uh, definitely not turning. Other than that, you got your throttle right here, and then you pull that knob out to shut the engine down. As far as loader controls, you have this guy here runs the bucket curl forward and backward, and this guy here runs the loader boom up and down. It's actually really nice and smooth controls. I'm very surprised at how well it all works. I guess it's time for me to bite the bullet. Got to climb underneath here and figure out what we're leaking. Oh, this is also good too. First time I've ever seen this. They got like an air fitting here on the fuel tank in case you just need to, you know, plumb your airline into the diesel fuel. Okay, so I think I figured out the answer to a couple of our issues here. That leak that's underneath the machine is like I said, the bell housing is full of fluid. Now, what kind of fluid? Well, it's a combination of water and diesel fuel, but where those the diesel fuel coming from? The diesel fuel is coming from the engine. It shouldn't be in the engine either, of course. As you can see, we just dipped our tank, or dipped our oil pan here. We're way over full, and it smells like old varnished diesel. I swore we checked that whenever I picked this thing up, and it looked okay, but obviously, not because it sure didn't just happen overnight here with that injector line that we fixed being cracked you know i don't know when that occurred but there was tank pressure there so just sitting there with the line off of it or cracked it could have been allowing fuel to slowly drip down and fill up the uh the oil pan that could have got cracked you know when that guy took it apart or it could have happened that day that i went to get this thing and tried to crank the engine and everything jumped all over the place in there it could have happened any time, but the reality right now is that there's a whole bunch of fuel where there's supposed to be a bunch of oil. Now the rear main seal in the engine is, uh, well, probably a little wore out at this point. And because the oil's so thin, it's really dumping into that bell housing. 
Now that that fuel leak is fixed though, we should be able to just drain the oil out, put some good stuff in it, and uh, be pretty well off. That might also jump our oil pressure up. If the oil's that thin, you know, that could be why we're not registering on the gauge, but it was pumping up to the rockers. It's not like it's actively pouring out of the bell housing now either. It was dripping a good bit where it was sitting when we fired it up for the first time, but by the time I walked it up here, it's really not leaking much at all. Let's turn our pet cock on the fuel filter here and see what comes out. Oh, maybe. There we go. Finally got some fuel coming out now. A bit of water in there. But nothing that would have kept us from running. We know one thing for sure. The engine got a good flush with all that diesel fuel in there. There ought to be no sludge at all. She ought to be nice and clean. I think we're going to have a gusher here. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's some that's some pretty thin oil. Oh man. Yep, there is no sludge in this crankcase. None. This engine is probably spick and span inside. Oh man, that's a lot of fuel in there. And this is this is 100% on me. I, I should have checked this before we started playing around with it again here. Like I said, I'm pretty sure I checked it at that guy's place before we started messing with it there. And it was either okay or I didn't check it like I thought I did. Luckily we're working with a Detroit. That could have damaged another engine, but the Detroit's not going to care at all. Right in the drain pan. Perfect. Still just dumping fuel. What the heck is holding this thing? I mean, it's like it's welded on there. That was unbelievably difficult. All right, well, back the next day, I got some replacement filters here. We need to clean out this housing first, though. I don't know how well you guys can see. There's a fair bit of junk down there. I mean, it's not horrible, but we'll get that cleaned out before we put a fresh filter in. Almost made a mistake here. The old filter has this special washer thing that rides on the spring. It's really stuck in there. This is our primary fuel filter. Got a nice new filter in there. There was a bunch of crud in that one too I had to clean out. All right, last one we have to do is this oil filter. Nice new filter. All right, so we're gonna toss some oil in this thing. I got straight 30 weight oil here because the last time we worked on a Detroit, I thought you guys were gonna have me arrested for putting multi-weight oil in your Detroit. And I just wanna say for the record that it does say in the Detroit service book not to use multi-grade oil. However, that being said, that service book was written in the 60s or the 70s. I am convinced that if there was scientific research done on it today, multi-grade oil would not be any different than the straight weight oil in these engines and you guys can argue about that in the comments that is just my opinion i have no research on that but i just know that oil technology has come so far since that time that uh i bet it, it would be just fine 
and it's definitely going to be better than the oil diesel concoction that we were running in here a little bit ago. All right, the oil's in. I think I overfilled it a little bit, but we're not gonna be able to get this thing to fire up until we bleed out these filters. Uh, this secondary fuel filter is after the fuel pump, which is right here. So we know that it's probably not gonna bleed on its own. I have this fitting cracked loose right here. There is a bleeder screw up here, which would be preferential, but the exhaust is in the way. There's really no way to get it. I can't even grab it with vice grips because it's a uh, button head. So I'm gonna crank the engine over and it should push fuel out right here. You guys just holler when the fuel comes and I'll come tighten it up. Good news is, is I see some fuel peeking out there so we can tighten this fitting up and hopefully fire it up now. Yeah, we got oil pressure now. <laughs> we went from zero PSI of oil pressure to 60 PSI of oil pressure. We're gonna come down a little bit now as things warm up, I'm sure. All right, she's running. We're gonna let her warm up for a bit. We went from zero PSI oil pressure on the gauge to right around 60 at first start. Now this is straight weight oil, so the oil pressure is going to be real high at first, and then as it warms up, it's going to come back down. I'd probably be happy with that thing to settle around 20 PSI. Anyways, we're going to let it warm up for a little bit, and then we are going to see if we can't run it around a little, and maybe that steering clutch will break loose for us.
right, well guys, I got this boom safely secured up in the air. It's braced uh, on both cylinders, so shouldn't have anything to worry about leaving it up in the air like that. It runs, it drives, it digs. As you guys saw, I was able to play around and dump a few scoops of this thing. Um, it's definitely not without its problems. There's still a, a list of things that would need to really be fixed on this thing before you could go putting it to work, but it does start up and drive and move and brake and do the basic functions that it needs to. This is probably where I'm gonna stop on it. I did not buy this machine to fix it up and use it around here. I've got plenty of better machines at my disposal around here. This thing doesn't really excite me much. That HD6 that's out there, even though it looks like it's in much worse shape, is actually in much better shape. If I can get that engine running one of these days, that would probably be a little loader that I wouldn't mind keeping around here. Although I suspect it's going to need a lot of work to get into operational condition as well. This old girl here has, has seen some stuff. <laughs> this thing's been through a battle or two. Um, but, as you guys saw, it does still run and function. So this could serve a purpose for someone. And that could potentially be one of you guys watching right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an eBay listing for this thing. I'm going to drop it down in the description and probably pin it in the comment there. If you guys are interested in this beauty, it's potentially up for grabs and it could be yours. Now, the last time I did this, I had auctioned off a Ford 9N tractor that I revived on the channel. The bidding went nuts. The tractor got bid up to well over what I thought it was worth. And then nobody paid me. <laughs> I'm not looking to make a fortune off of this thing. The main reason I do this stuff is because I feel like I'm doing a good deed saving this thing from the crusher. There is still life left in it. Somebody could play around with this thing on the farm or their piece of land that they have or whatever. It still does serve a purpose. The engine seems to run pretty well. The only real issue with the engine that I can see is maybe we're still getting some fuel into the oil from somewhere else. The only other place I know that could happen from is the fuel pump on the side of the engine. The diaphragm could be bad in the fuel pump and it could be allowing fuel to go into the crankcase. So I think the engine is just fine though. That's a cheap, easy fix if that's the case. So not really a big deal there. It does drive fine. All the gears worked. I did try all the gears out. The hydraulics all function as you can see here. She's just been used too much when she was new. So if you're looking for a production machine, this isn't it. I'll be 100% truthful as I can in the description on eBay, and you guys have seen the whole story here. So everything I know about this machine is the same thing that you guys know. At the end of the day, it's just my main concern that we save stuff like this from the crusher. It helps me sleep a little bit better at night. So like I said, if you guys would like to own this beauty, the link is down in the description. Maybe you can buy it just in time for Christmas. Boy, wouldn't this look so good nestled up underneath the tree in the living room. Not going in our yard, Russ. It's going in our living room. But anyways, guys, that's all I've got. So you know the drill. If you like this video, do me a big favor. Hit that thumbs up button down below. It really helps out the channel. Doesn't cost you guys a dime. The holidays are sneaking up fast, as I believe I probably mentioned earlier. If you want to get stuff delivered before Christmas, you've got to order it now. Otherwise, we can't guarantee it's going to be there in time for the big day. So head over to the store. The link to that is in the description as well. That's dieselcreek.com. Get yourself some sweet swag and you can be looking good on Christmas morning. But I think that's it. So as always, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you on the next one. Later. Mm -hmm.